this is lecture 31 of ECE 5312. And so in today's lecture, what we're doing is we're building upon what we've experienced in the last several lectures regarding multi-carrier modulation. So what was the punchline of multi-carrier modulation in OFDM? Divide and conquer, right? Almost sounds military-like, but in reality, this is what's been helping the last decade of wireless communications technology reach the high, ludicrous data rates that we've been experiencing to date, right? Like, right now, people are talking about, like, hundreds of megabits per second being delivered reliably over wireless communications channel um, to, well, maybe not cell phones quite yet, but other wireless standards. And it's just a matter of time before we reach that level in other wireless technologies, including cellular technology. But this is kind of an interesting and kind of an extreme twist or, um, what's a better way, taking full advantage of this divide and conquer strategy. Okay? So I'm going to illustrate this um, on the whiteboard here. Okay. 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 I'm bringing up my smart notebook because it's just so smart. Okay. So I, I'm not sure what people's backgrounds are in wireless communications. We talked a little bit about this before. So in the frequency domain, we talk about a frequency selective fading channel, right? So let's say this is some sort of attenuation. I wish I can spell today. Uh, much better. Okay. And this is caused by a multipath fading channel. It could be caused by a variety of distortions. And so what is the characteristic? If I have a transmission that's occurring across this band, this becomes very tricky, right? What happens is different frequencies of that transmission are being attenuated more than others. Um, so the answer is, okay, so the question is, how do we deal with this? So we can either deal with time domain equalizers, and we saw about um, zero forcing equalizers. We, we just briefly mentioned decision feedback equalizers, but um, rather complex solutions, right? Or not feasible in case of zero forcing. So multi-carrier modulation in the divide and conquer strategy, what it does is it takes, let's say, one narrowband transmission that's almost independent, and then it takes another narrowband transmission next to it, and another one. And I, and I keep on drawing subcarriers, right? So what happens is multi-carrier modulation, what it's doing is it's transmitting information down these slivers of narrowband transmissions all at the same time and reconstituting them at the receiver. That's, uh, you know, so how many people here read Weinstein and Ebert's paper? So I know Travis did, you guys. Fun paper, right? Did you check out the biographies? You know, even in the 70s, people look cool. But what happens is, it was quite elegant how, in those days, they had a very simple mathematical construct, the DFT, right? FFTs, might have been around that time. I have to check the history books. But definitely computer te computing technology was not up to snuff to support gigabit per second traffic using OFDM or multi-carrier, right? Before that, you had um, Sol Salzburg's paper, um, 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 which focused on cosine modulated filter banks spread across frequency. And conceptually, people said, yeah, this is cool. Oh my god, that's going to be so expensive hardware-wise. How are we going to fit that into a computer, a laptop, a radio, a modem, right? And then these guys came along and said, mathematically, this is the same as a DFT and an IDFT, right? And then later on, computer engineers, um, let's say if you're an FPGA designer, says, I got an IP core for a really fast FFT implementation. Boom, right? And now you've got something really efficient. Better yet, how about a microchip? How about it, like a little, little chip that you put on the board? Boom. Your modulation to multi-carrier is all accomplished, right? Now, what, I'm, what, I'm, what this lecture is all about takes this thing to the very extreme. And this is something close to my heart because this was my PhD thesis. What happened was, so divide and conquer is great. Why is it great? Because when you treat each subcarrier for distortion, the equalizer 
looks at the approximate gain of the channel. And let's say there's also a phase response. I've left it out, but there's also a phase response. Could be linear phase, could be some weird phase. But what happens is, from the viewpoint of the sliver of the narrow band channel, it only sees I'm being attenuated by this flat amount, and I have this phase. What do you do? You amplify, and you undo the phase. You maybe you want a linear phase response across everything. Maybe you want a flat phase response, right? So it really is truly divide and conquer. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Because, so for instance, let's, let's say we take this attenuation, right? So we equalize it, and we saw what happened. We saw what happened. If there's noise present, and we do the equalization at the receiver, bad things happen, right? We amplify the noise. So what you end up getting, like let's say noise is here. Okay? And then let's say I design an equalizer that undoes, does, reverses the effect of the attenuation. Now I've got noise that's been enhanced and amplified and shaped in the form of the equalizers. Bad news, right? You do pre-equalization. What is the mortal enemy of doing anything on a per subcarrier basis in a transceiver system? The overhead channel. So let's look at this more carefully. I know I'm a little bit digressing from the lecture, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rein this back in. So bear with me, OK? So what happens is, here's your data. It then goes through your serial to parallel, your IFFT. Maybe do parallel serial. I'm leaving out the cyclic extension for now. You do serial to parallel. FFT equalize. Let's say for now, but let's say ra rather pre. Actually, either way. Let's do it here. Let's say we, we can pre-equalize. That's a bigger eraser. Boop. So let's say we pre-eq. Okay. And then FFT, you have your pesky noise. You make a decision, you parallel serial, and then what you get is the reconstructed version of your transmitted signal, right? And what is the Achilles tendon of all of this? Overhead channel. The problem with this type of scheme is that the transmitter and receiver need to be very closely coordinated with each other. So how will the transmitter know how to pre-equalize? It would need channel sounding information that the transmitter would send over the channel to the receiver. The receiver would then decode and say, ah, here are the levels of attenuation on each subcarrier and the phase. Oh, I'm going to quantize this stuff. Hmm, quantization error. I'm going to then compress it. Mm, compression error, send it back over the overhead channel, mm, latency, and then it's received, then it's decoded, then you design your equalizers. Oh, is this changing over every OFDM symbol? Yes, it is. Mm, lots overhead. You know, so the question is, is it really worth it? And you know, the, the, the thing is, what is the impact of quantization, latency, compression? Um, even, even for the most part, like getting an accurate model of what the channel is, as well as, well as like what we're going to look at today, which is bit and power loading, right? So let's say instead of equalization, it's almost the same. I'm going to keep this thing here for a minute. So let's say instead of equalization, so here's my OFDM. And let's have the bad channel. Okay? What I can do is instead of equalize, I can actually just dump more power into this, right? So I can do what we did a few lectures ago, which is water fill, right? So let so but 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 that's not quite what I want to do, right? Because water fill, 
Am I investing power in the right place? Here's the other thing. What sort of modulation schemes do I have available? Am I only doing BPSK? How about 64 QAM? 256 QAM, QPSK, 16 QAM. The reason is, suppose like your noise is here. Your red is the attenuation. Suppose that your SNR in this subcarrier, let's say with everything considered, so remember what the SNR is. It's the transmit power times the channel attenuation. Maybe there's also path loss as well. So the channel attenuation magnitude squared because it's a PSD, right? And then divided by the noise power, that gives you your SNR. Let's say the SNR there is like 27 dB. Do I use BPSK? It's going to be totally awesome, like zero errors. But QPSK at that SNR level will also be quite powerful. Even 16 qualm, even 64 qualm for, let's say, probability of error of 10 to the minus 5. That's, that's cool, right? So perhaps here, the SNR that's 27 dB, I'm going to choose 64 QAM as my modulation scheme. Now, this poor sucker over here has 4 dB SNR. Do I use 64 QAM for him? No. Unless you want an error rate of 0.5. So here, you would select BPSK. Now, what is the problem with this before we even go to logistical problems of implementing in hardware? So if I have n equals 1,024, I have 1,024 degrees of freedom. Like, which modulation scheme should I use? And like, you know, well, not only that, but let's say it's a discrete number of modulation schemes. BPSK, QPSK, 16 QAM, 64 QAM, 256 QAM, maybe a few others thrown in there. So I have a discrete set of choices. I also have 1,024 places where I can tweak this. Oh, oh, on top of this, let's say my channel changes quite rapidly. How can I keep up with this, right? So there are a lot of problems with this. Here's the additional wrinkle. Some folks also propose using power allocation. Not water filling wise, but let's say with just a little bit more power. Let's say over here. Let's take this guy here. Let's say if I just put a little bit more power here, I can have some pretty decent error performance for 256 qualm. Oh, and, and what happens is maybe if I take a little bit power off of here, I still have decent performance for 16 QAM. Oh, but what happens if I put a lot of power here and bring him up to 64 QAM and keep him the same? You see where I'm getting at? Like, you know, the, the, you know even at 64 subcarriers, which is what's supported in most Wi-Fi standards, how do you keep track of this? 64 dimensions, I have five possible modulation schemes to choose from. Oh, and a continuum of power values. Where do I make the decision, right? So today's lecture, you're going to see some of the approaches that are out there, but there are several caveats, right? So here's the problem. A lot of the mathematical expressions that you're about to see make the assumption that, oh, you need 2.3 bits for this subcarrier per symbol. What modulation scheme modulates 2.3 bits? BPSK? Uh, no, QPSK? Well, that's 2 bits. Uh, 8PSK, no, that's 3 bits. Do we have it? You know, the problem is there's already inherent rounding in the process. So what happens is, you know, and people are still looking at this. This is kind of an open-ended problem. Can you come up with a way that you can use an integer number of bits and a continuum of power levels and tweak it to maximize? And, and there are ways. There are a lot of computer science techniques for searching, but then at 1,024, so let's say the team of Matt and Travis, you guys are looking at pilot tone placement across large OFDM transmissions, right? Not easy. Brute force is very brute, right? So there's that problem, and then there's the other problem again, the overhead channel. So imagine now you need to communicate the 1,024 modulation schemes and power levels. Oh, they're quantized along with whatever your channel conditions are 
to the transmitter from the receiver. Both have to be in cahoots with each other in order to operate properly, right? The other problem that you're going to find with this, and you know, there's some, there's some, so I, I always like to advocate practical. I don't know. We'll see. But what happens is, so one practical way, and I published a paper on this several years ago, is if the channel doesn't vary too fast over frequency, you can modify, let's say, groupings of subcarriers. You might have a little bit of a penalty in terms of error performance, and it might not be truly divide and conquer at its most extreme, but you save on overhead, and you also save on time to reconfigure all these subcarriers and such, right? Including power levels. And there are a variety of other techniques. Some people use lookup tables. If they know exactly what the SNR is, it's like, boom, you are this configuration, and just automatically reconfigure. So there are a lot of workarounds around this. But from a theoretical perspective, this is a very complex problem. All right? So if we go back... So I just want to this idea of divide and conquer. And when I'm talking about divide and conquer, you can go as far and as crazy as what I've just talked about. You can change what the modulation scheme is on each subcarrier per symbol epoch. You can change the transmit power. You can also, part of my dissertation thesis, what I did was I also f said, let's suppose that the subcarriers were not sufficiently narrow band and that there was actually several degrees of freedom in terms of the channel attenuation. It wasn't flat. It wasn't just a gain. There was actually quite a bit of variation. What do you do then? You do something, let's say, in some of the subcarriers, maybe you have a lot of variation. In other subcarriers, it's relatively flat you do what they call equalizer tap loading. What happens is some, some of the fr uh, frequency bands, what you do is you, um, you use an equalizer, maybe more than one tap, to compensate for, let's say, the more than one degree of freedom for your channel attenuation, and others you use one tap. Now, you have some issues over there, like latency. If you use an FAR filter, some of the subcarriers now are no longer in alignment with another, and then it becomes a trick trying to line them up. And also, how, like, you know, what's the trade-off between that and just filling up with more subcarriers? So there's, as you can see, there's an infinite ways of slicing and dicing multi-carrier modulation. But that's what makes it so beautiful. It's very versatile. Its only enemy, other than the overhead channel, is mobility. It's not well suited for very highly mobile wireless platforms. So people probably have heard of WiMAX, and it lost to LTE and LTA. Boo. Um, the Korean uh, telecommunication industry, they were really keen about having high-speed wireless support like they had for Wi-Fi and WiMAX, you know, like tens and hundreds of megabits per second. But they wanted to do it on their high-speed trains. So then I believe they, they called it Y-Pro. And it was supposed to be like really high speed and supposed to follow the train and stuff. And there are a variety of solutions that were out there. Even in LTA nowadays, they talk about like, you know, the ideal mobile conditions and then sort of the stretch conditions. And mobility has always been kind of like a problem with OFDM because of its sensitivity if you don't sample exactly on the center, the center frequencies of the subcarriers. If you're a little bit off and stuff, disaster happens when you take the FFT of them. So what bit and power allocation do is they tailor the subcarrier to whatever is the prevailing channel condition on a subcarrier by subcarrier basis. Or if you want sort of like a quick, dirty solution, you can do it on groupings of subcarriers too, right? So what happens is um, you can tailor this and there have been a variety of ways of doing this where you can change the data rate and the transmit power. So let's say we go back to that wonderful model that I was talking about, you know, the commutator, you know, that thing with the arm, like, do, 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 you know, sound effects included. But now what happens is how, how, would you, how would you do this? Like, you know, so the question is, okay, so I'm dumping different number of bits per subcarrier across all these subcarriers. How do they align? What, what, what's the common, what is the common trait here? What should I be careful about? What, like, you know, my, my, my subcarrier has a fixed bandwidth. 
if I'm putting different bits into them, like what, what gives? The answer, same symbol duration. So as long as you keep 64 QAM, BPSK, QPSK, and all those guys across the same T, you can dump different number of bits in using something called an adaptive commutator. So it's like three bits there, two there, five there, one there, but the symbol duration is the same as long as you know how to convert those bits into the right modulation scheme. Right? And then what happens is we create the composite waveform. That's our OFDM transmission. After, um, after we've, we've, we've modulated each one, each one of these subbands, and all of them are time aligned in terms of symbol period. And so, w again, wh what's, what's, the advantage, what's the advantage of doing bit allocation? Maximize as much as possible the data rate while meeting some sort of other performance objective. What's my favorite one? Bit error rate, right? So what happens is, suppose we go back to the model that I have over here. And you notice, oh, if let's say I keep everything at 16 QAM on this channel, like uh, 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 on this OFDM symbol, every symbol, like every OFDM subcarrier is 16 QAM, 16 QAM, 16 QAM. Over here, that's going to be a disaster, right? It's going to take a huge performance hit. We're going to have 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, beta rates on those subcarriers. And the other subcarriers, maybe they're going to do fantastically well. Oh, I need better control of my pen. <laughs> Let me try it again. Yay! Okay. So why should I be worried about this? So, why is this a concern? And the answer is the following. Let's get rid of this because we don't need it anymore. Oh, my dear. I'm just like so technologically unsavvy, it's not funny. Okay, so what happens is bit rate, let's say, so how many bits are 16 QAM? Four. So you have four plus four plus four plus four. Theoretically, if we have n subcarriers, you would have n times four bits per OFDM symbol, right? Not bad symbol. Now, what's the problem? Probability of error. Because each one's an independent narrowband transmission, right? The guys that are doing well, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8. Now combine it with the bad guys. 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 3. That's a good one. Who's going to dominate the error performance? These guys, right? And that really sucks in terms of the uh, overall data rate. So what you do instead with adaptive modulation is the following. So what happens is you now say wherever there's poor performance, this is sort of like a first order approximation. Let's keep transmit power constant. Okay, let's keep the variability to a minimum. So let's say my bit allocation now is let's say there were some at the ends that were really doing well. Let's say we add six bits, six bits. Now we're going down into let's say the heavy attenuation areas. In some cases, you might want to ha allocate nothing. Just literally turn off subcarrier. It's doing so poorly. It's like, throw it away. It's trash. Then, oh, now we're getting a little bit of performance. Okay? And you say, ah, nice. And, and you know, this data right here might be the same as this guy here. Just, but, Where's the advantage? Error probability. So usually when we do, you might not know it, but the tailoring of the subcarriers, bit and power allocation, is a form of optimization. And I'll go back to why this sort of optimization is kind of tricky. But in general, what happens is we have a constraint. 
our constraint in this case is, let's say we have a probability of error performance overall. So let's say mean or whatever you want to call it. And this guy, let's say the mean probability of error cannot exceed 10 to the minus 5. Then you choose your modulation schemes accordingly. Now, here's the weirdness. How would I average the probability of error? What's the expression like? The answer is you sum, uh, blah, 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 blah. let's say i equals 1 to n. That's the number of subcarriers. Then I would have the probability of error of subcarrier i times the number of bits for subcarrier i. And then divide it by the total number of bits that were transmitted per symbol. And the reason for that is it's all weighted. The subcarrier that has six bits per symbol, I'm sending six bits per symbol. That has a law of weight, as opposed to the guy I'm only transmitting one bit per symbol. So it's a weighted average. And that's why we do the mean of the probability of error. So we go back and we say, oh, OK, you know, what is the probability of error performance? And it becomes very tricky. But in the end, we constrain it by this. We can also constrain it by a number of other factors. Like, for instance, like, well, well, what we try and do is we try and maximize the number of bits constrained to the probability of error performance. If we also had transmit power to choose from, too, we would also like, impose a total power constraint. Because you know it's quite easy. Oh, my SNR is so, is so awful, I'm going to put so much power into this thing, it's like a laser. You know, Basically, the classroom across the, 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 the building over there, there would be a hole right through its wall, too. We can't do that. right? So we'll have a total power constraint. We might even have a subband power constraint. Basically, imagine like you have a total power constraint. Well, why not I put all my power into one delta and send all that? And wouldn't that be cool? Spark gap radio with a lot of spark. You know, problem with that is again it might violate FCC regulations. So what happens is we have a subband sub power constraint too, right? So we go back to this guy here. And so what happens is this is here. What we're trying to do is, you know, the, the bit rates per subcarrier may vary, but the symbol rates stay the same, right? So, so what that means is basically the rate at which each symbol is being generated based on the bits that are being fed in by the adaptive commutator, that's different across all subcarriers. But the outputs of the modulation on each subcarrier are lockstep. And the reason is they all need to arrive at the input to the IFFT all at the exact same time. Right? So, so that, that's really kind of mentally think, well, my bits are coming in different, but they're all being converted into the same symbol at the same time. If they're you put in a delay. What happens is you must absolutely have everything time aligned, every subcarrier. Number of bits per, per subcarrier is not 2.3 bits here, 5.9 bits there. No, 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 no. It's a discrete quantity. The problem is a lot of the optimization techniques out there are continuous. Gradient approaches, all that sort of jazz. The problem with them is they expect to have some sort of convex, concave, or some sort of fitness function that is continuous across all values, and then you find the minima, the maxima, whatever, right? It doesn't quite work that well, because then you have to quantize the result here, because bits are discrete. So you might wonder. And this is sort of like, you know, I haven't looked at this in years, but you might, might want to look at it. It's actually pretty cool. Um, where do you think they op people do optimization on discrete quantities in the research community? Do they do that in electrical engineering? No? Computer science? Probably not, maybe. Management. They have math and management? Yeah. I actually cited a paper from a journal called Management Science from 1961. 
that talked about discrete optimization. What, and you might say, well, how does that work? Why do management people need to know about discrete optimization? It's all about the market, right? It's like, how, like you know, people don't sell 2.3 cars, right? They sell four cars, they sell three cars, they sell two cars. How do you optimize that? How do you, like, you know, where's your fitness function? So there was a paper published in 1961 in Management Science that talked about how you do the discrete optimization. So, you, so what happens is it kind of has a gradient-like approach, but it's at very discrete intervals, and you sort of follow the gradient down that path. Now, here's the problem with this scheme. Your, the problem is you have one bit, two bit, four, six, eight, like, you know, what, what happens is you're now not having everything spaced out properly and you have little bumps. So it's, it gets very messy. Let's put it that way. But in general, let's say, let's say we forget about the discrete problem just for one second. This box here basically is what we call rate maximization. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to maximize the data rate. So the sum of all the bits, we're trying to make this thing as, like, as much throughput as possible, but it's subject to, in this case, a bit of uh, some pro sort of probability of error constraint. And I look at it and I say, ah, oh, I did not weigh it properly. So that's a little bit of a boo-boo. It should, unless you have the exact same modulation scheme every subcarrier, that should not be 1 over n. It should be 1 over the sum of all the bits, and then each probability of error should be weighed by the number of bits per subcarrier. Okay? But what happens is the overall gist is this is like the classic optimization problem. I maximize this subject to that. Right? And it makes sense because I can transmit a ton of information. But if I have a probability of error of 0.5, it's totally useless, right? So this, this thing is really important. So let's look at an example. And the example is the following. So what happens is, just like before, what happens is I have this scheme, OK, it's this transmission channel. And it has a frequency response. and Let's say these are all attenuation levels. Where I have severe attenuation, I choose my, ro my most robust candidate, BPSK. I might even be in such a horrible state of affairs, I'll just say, mm, manana, forget it. Tomorrow, and I turn him off. I just don't deal with him. The, and maybe some guys are like, mm, so, so good, QPSK for you. And then maybe even higher up, like 8PSK on the really good channels. So what ends up happening is we have subcarrier 0, subcarrier 1, subcarrier 2, right? And the really heavily attenuated channels would give BPSK, our most robust modulation scheme. Maybe we might even turn it off. For a so-so, we will use QPSK. For really good guys, we might use AP, APSK. And so we do this because what we're trying to do is get the most bits across, but satisfy potentially a very strict error performance constraint, overall error performance constraint. So, I mentioned him in the last lecture, in lecture 30. And I think he's an emeritus professor at Stanford now. And he founded some company, and he's doing pretty well, right? John Chioffi. And all his students, like a lot of his students actually carried on his work and stuff. Um, he came up with an approach, and this approach, like, it's, it's quick, it's easy. I would say it's, it, there are some flaws with it because it assumes a continuum of bits that can be allocated when, in fact, it should be discrete. But that's, you know, again, that, that would affect performance in some. But what he, what he did create is a quick and dirty way of allocating number of bits without having to, like, a human. So, so here's the thing. You can choose, like, let's say if I give you in the next class test or quiz, okay, here's 1,024 subcarriers find the best bit allocation for it. You guys will kill me, right? I, I don't hold it past you. Like, you know, where's that car again? And it ain't the white forerunner, right? But what happens is, Chiaffi came up with an awesome way of calculating approximately, ballpark, what is the number of bits that are suitable for that subcarrier across all subcarriers. And it uses something called the SNR gap. So what he did is he took Shannon's capacity, 
which we know and love, right? C is equal to the bandwidth. So capacity is equal to the bandwidth times lo uh, log 2 of 1 plus the SNR. And then he modified it. Uh, should be, yeah, yeah, there, it should be. Um, good point, good point. But what happens is that disappears in what his modification is. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, because, because two of something, but there should be a one over W. Thank you. But right at the front, and then he put gamma. What the heck is gamma? This is his fudge factor. So what happens is he said, okay, if I divide the bandwidth, I get bits, right? And, but then he said, yeah, but um, does this work for every modulation scheme or the optimal one, right? So what he did is he said, how, okay, so how far away in terms of S B to reach, let's say, BPSK modulation. Like, you know, BPSK uncoded at this range of SNRs, how far is it capacity-wise from the max, you know, the best possible error-free capacity situation? So what he did is this equation on top here, the BI is equal to log 2, 1 plus signal-to-noise ratio on the i subcarrier divided by big gamma. Big gamma is off. It's that SNR gap between optimal Shannon capacity limit, right, and where, where, like, let's say whatever modulation scheme you're using, you might wonder, where did he get gamma, theoretically? What he did is, essentially, he took the union bound on the error probability. Um, I, I forgot which modulation scheme. Every modulation scheme is different. So basically, this will, like, if you're using a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, whatever sort of, like, you know, if you're using QAM, PAM, QPSK, you're going to have to come up with a different fudge factor. But what he did is he said, okay, if you're using this modulation scheme, you use this gamma, you plug it in there, what's your SNR? Boom, that's what your bits should be. What's the problem? 2.3 bits. So is it you use two bits or you use three bits? Here's the workaround. Oh, yes, there is a workaround. As you can see, I could talk about this for hours. But I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, homework has been posted online. Have we calculated gamma? The big gamma? Yeah. So depending on, OK, so if you know what your transmit power is, you know what your modulation scheme. So the union bound expression, um, I believe that's for like the PSK modulations, right? But depending on what sort of modulation scheme you have and what your transmit power is, it will dictate what your gamma should be. And then you plug that into the expression and say, okay, how many bits should this be? You know, so, so that's, that's how it should work. But again, it's a fudge factor, right? So th they use a union bound, so it's not really the exact value either. But, the, but what, what it's trying to do is, you know what the absolute is. And we can find what the optimal bits are, but, but for this case, which is not optimal, what, how many bits should we use for this modulation family with this transmit power? this band with all that jazz, right? But, but what, what Chiaffi did is, let's say we take, again, the scheme, and you use bi is equal to log 2, 1 plus gamma i over the fudge factor. So you choose your fudge factor. And let's say you have 2.3 bits, uh, 3.9 bits, and then, and so on and so forth. So let's say 4.2 bits, 1.2 bits, and then uh, let's say 2.9 bits. And you might, okay, so what happens is you're going to need to round, right? So this is a beauty of combining power allocation with bit allocation. So this tells you that right across the board, if you have this expression and such, um, and what the, is it, actually, no, sorry, I take that back. It's not transmit power, my mistake. I think it's, um, this should be the problem.
that's the in gap is your sort of like you want to isolate the SNR and what PT is the target probability of error. Okay, sorry. So I saw P, I thought it was transmit power. So the, this is the probability of error. So let's say I want 10 to the minus 5 probability of error. Boom. And so also you have to use the inverse Q function to solve it, but this gives you now, this is the SNR. And it's the, S, and it's the amount, like for that ideally, I need this SNR using this union bound. This is the amount of SNR you need to be far away from the optimal, um, let's say, capacity bound that's established by Shannon. And then use Shannon's expression to find out what the bits are for that target probability of error. So gamma, big gamma changes from one subchannel to the other? Yes. Well, it depends on the family modulation schemes and if you maintain the same target uh, probability of error. So if you want 10 to the minus 5, which in this case, like let's say my ultimate goal is across the board, I want 10 to the minus 5 BER, right? I would set PT to be equal to that, and then plug it in, and that union bound says, yeah, the SNR gap should be blah, right? You then plug it in to this expression here, right? And then whatever your signal to noise ratio is on that subcarrier, you plug it in, and it will give you what the bits should be for that modulation scheme. So in reference to Shannon's capacity, that's now been normalized by the bandwidth, which will give you now the bits. And given the target probability of error, the, the back off, if you will, from, the S, from the, that capacity, the SNR gap, it will tell you this is the number of bits you'll have for this specific error situation, right? Because remember, Sh Shannon capacity, what did he say about the Shannon capacity? The maximum data rate, coding, and all that in order to achieve error-free communications. And then what happens is now you're backing off from that and you're saying, oh, I'm going to accept, accept some error, but how well will I do? What will be the number of bits? What will be my capacity in that situation? Right? Also, oh, this is just to allow some error. Yes. Unlike yeah. Shannon, so, that doesn't allow any. Exactly. So the, the question is, like, will this allow some errors? Absolutely. So we're, we don't care about error-free communications. We care about having some error. That's why we have this fudge factor say, we're not going to do exactly error-free. We're going to have some error, and this is how far we want to be in order to achieve that. How many bits do I need? Boom. Good question. And then what happens is, now you have this configuration, and you say, well, if I increase, if I round this up to three bits, what's my probability of error? Oh, it's minus four. That doesn't satisfy it. So what you do is you might want to up the power in this subcarrier too, in order to compensate. But then let's say you have a total power constraint. Three, uh, let's say we take this guy here, 4.2. He's awfully far from 5 bits, right? We might want to lower him to 4 and decrease his power in order to maintain 10 to the minus 5 probability of error. So you see, it's like tweaking. It's like fine-tuning. all. But that's where machine learning, that's where lookup tables, that's where all that cool jazz, the software-defined radio and cognitive radio stuff that I talk about all the time, kicks in. It's all tweaking. Yes, Paolo? The VR constraint is for the entire... It's right across the board. So, so, so what happens is, you're, so the BR constraint is the overall bit area, area constraint. So what you want to do with this technique is you'll say, what's a good starting point? How about I let every guy have 10 to the minus 5 probability of error, and that way, right across the board, the average is that. But, oh, wait a minute, we have uh, decimal quantities of bits. That's bad. So what we do is we begin rounding up and down, we play with the power levels, and then we keep our fingers crossed that we have an aggregate probability of error not exceeding the threshold, in this case, 10 to the minus 5. Yes, Neil? Sorry, you have to repeat that. What? Can you not accumulate the fractional bits and then send them the whole No, um, so the question is, can you accumulate the fractional bits and send them as a whole bit? Um, the answer is, uh, it's an interesting idea, but remember, you need to be symbol aligned. So if you accumulate, then there needs to be a point where, let's say, else. So you could do that, but I think now you're dealing with weird sort of symbol rates in order to accomplish that. So it's a lot easier architecture-wise in order to
just say, I rather round it up and just dump it. Like, basically what happens is what you want to achieve is essentially, in this symbol period, I want to take care of all my modulation and mapping. I don't want to have any sort of carryover until the next one and stuff. It, it just, I, like, you know, you have to put memory in the system. It gets kind of complicated and such. So, but it's a good idea. Before we solve this problem, do we have an idea about the number of bits that has to be carried over the all freedom symbol? Can because I here we calculate it based on the power. That's it. Mm -hmm. So okay. vi is just a function of the power. Okay. S and R. But what if the, the, this number of bits exceeds, uh, is, no, is less than the total number of bits we want to carry on this all freedom symbol? Okay, so the, so the question is, um, just to, to recap, um, do, do, do we already know what the target uh, transmit number of bits overall is? Over the all VM symbol beforehand. Like the easy answer is you just round down and do the math. So you be but, okay, okay, but, okay, so here's the thing. So the target is we want to maximize as much as possible given subject to constraint. As for rounding down, sure, we can take that approach, but then we're not dividing and conquering optimally or close to optimal. Like, you know, the, the beautiful thing is here, we're tweaking, we're fine-tuning, we're doing all of this. So it's if the sum of vi is less than the number of bits we want to send over the symbol, then we have to sacrifice some bit. Yeah. So, so that, that's, ex uh, yeah. So if, let's say, so as you said, so, so, if we, so if we have a situation where we're, trans we're not transmitting enough bits, it's probably that our probability of error constraint is just way too stringent and we'll, we won't, under those channel conditions, exactly. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Fun, huh? I did this for four years. <laughs>
I have this waveform. I have this waveform. And I have this waveform. And then I combine them all together. What do I get? This waveform. And what happens is if my dynamic range of my R front end is not big enough, I get clipping and disastrous things happen, right? And I mentioned about Chiaffi's patent in this area, how he came up with a way, even if you had clipping, he can recover it at the receiver. There are techniques, and he patented one of them. So this is called peak to, power, peak to average power ratio. And what it means is you have sort of the average transmit power, everything's nicely behaved, and they're combining together. And then you have like really, really serious situations, like what I've just illustrated over here. This is bad news. Let's say every, the stars align very badly, and you have a superstorm. This is what you got. And it's so bad that your R front end can't cope with it. Now, yes? What if your subcarriers for uh, OFDM used sort of continuous uh, power modulation with a K or like MSK mm -hmm. approach? Do you still have the same like, power? So, okay, so the question is if you use like a continuous modulation, so basically a con constant amplitude modulation, yeah, then you don't have this problem. Um, on the other hand, like, you know, a lot of schemes out there use QAM and other sort of amplitude modulation, so that is a big issue, like, especially, like, Wi-Fi and, and such. You know, but, the, like, if you had a continuous amplitude, a, a, a CFM or, a, you know, basically if the amplitude's always constant and it's just, like, the phase that's rotating and stuff, yeah, no problem. Like, the, basically everything's going to add up, uh, um, you know, to be the same, and uh, just the phase that you have to, well, even the phase, yeah, the phase won't, uh, factor into it. It's just when you have like multiple amplitudes, there's several peaks that coincide, yeah. boom. Then why is the answer not just to use something like that? Well, cost, right? And then synchronization techniques, right? So, so let's say, like, you know, first of all, like, you know, the folks that make these standards and stuff, the first thing they think about is, okay, how do we make this thing cheap, right? How do we make this receiver that can fit on, you know, the size of a little USB thing that I just plug into the side and I have Wi-Fi, right? And, and if you use like CFM and such, now how do you do synchronization of an OFD, OFDM transceiver that uses that type of modulation? At, it's, no, no, I, I haven't seen any schemes like that. Maybe you have, but almost all the schemes I've seen has always been QAM-based, BPSK, QPSK, and not much else variation. It's kind of boring, but good question. Okay. Represented by this expression down below, and what it basically says is, let's say you have the you have your composite OFDM signal, you look for where it has a peak, you take the magnitude squared of it, and then you divide it by the average of that OFDM symbol in order to give you the par. And so, one thesis I would recommend that all of you check out. Um, it's actually one of the PhD students that I co-advised at University of Kansas, Rakesh Rajbanshi. His entire PhD thesis was on par. I mean, in all its gory details, par, par, par. And he came up with like nine, ten par reduction techniques and stuff. So it's a fun, fun topic. And it is always one that's of great concern, um, especially when we are dealing with larger. Because what happens is the more and more subcarriers you start transmitting over the air, like 1024, uh, 4098, and, and even more, this becomes a problem. All right? So you should just be aware whenever people talk about PAPR, like, for instance, the thesis defense this coming Friday, you know, just ask, oh, what about the PAR problem? <sighs> Don't tell her that. Um, it is an issue. OFDM is plagued by this. But um, as a result, um, you know, some people have done analyses, and if you have a decent RF front end, um, and you don't care about the occasional clipping that's occurred because of high PAPR, you're fine, right? You just reconstruct you. There are also some techniques where what happens is, like following Neil's comment about, like, could you use constant, some sort of constant amplitude modulation that just has information in other forms, like phase or frequency? Well, here's another trick. Let's say you use QAM modulation, right? Let's say for every possible 
uh, symbol, you have two actual signal constellation points that you can transmit, and you choose the one for every one of the subcarriers that minimizes PAPR. That's a possibility, right? So there are techniques out there to adaptively, but that, it ha that has its own issues too. Because what happens is the decision region now, decision regions become more complicated when you begin m matching multiple signal constellation points to the same symbol, right? So, be so it g things get a little bit more tricky. Oh. Okay, so that concludes lecture 31. Okay. Yay. So yeah, so what we're going to do now is take a five minute break.